some of the announcements. So please join me as we pray before today's message. Father, I thank you for what's going on today. We are so grateful as we get this day to honor our mothers, although it shouldn't be only one day a year. It should be every year, every day. And Father, we thank you because we should be honoring you every day. And we thank you for this opportunity to recognize how you created women and the responsibility and the assignment and the opportunity to have children. We are grateful, Father God. And we know there are those women out there that may have had pain and might have pain right now because they haven't had a child or haven't been able to have a child or have done something where they regret it. But, Father God, we know that you forgive it all. We thank you, Lord, as we heard in these words that you were speaking and recorded in Luke about going after one Father God, and we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to repent, as it says there, as you said, for the one that will repent. And so, Father God, we thank you for that opportunity to come before you and ask for your forgiveness when we've done something wrong. We thank you, Lord, for your grace and mercy, which is so hard for us to understand. We don't understand your ways. They are great and mighty. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity, and we come to you humbly to seek a renewed mind to seek your kind of heart. We thank you, Father God, for this opportunity. And we say all this in the name of your mighty Son, Yeshua Yamashiach, Jesus the Messiah. Amen. So today I'm going to talk about a godly heritage. I'm going to talk about moms, women. I'm going to stir the pot a little bit in this too. So hang on. It's almost one of those days I think I almost have to lock the doors because you might be like, man, his mother today, what are you going to get that's going to be so controversial? Well, hang on. Now, I start today with a very popular scripture, Proverbs 22, 6. The Bible says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. So I wanted to begin today sharing a little story, and I hope I don't mess it up, but I heard this on the radio I think it was while I was in Texas, so that would have been like 2003 to 2006. And um, um, it was uh, a mother was on this radio show sharing this story. And she was a mother of four. All of her four kids were adults. And, which is, um, and, and her children had friends. And one of her son's friends that was an adult now lived in a city that she was going to be going to. And he owned a home. And he said, hey, I have a roommate, but I have another bed, and we've got plenty of room. If you want to stay with me, you can. And she was like, great, you know, then I don't have to buy, sp spend money on a hotel, and it would be nice to visit. I'm only there for a day, you know, spend one night. And so she stays at this home. And while they're there that evening having dinner, the young man shares a story about a ladle. You know, a ladle that you scoop out, you know, maybe for soup or stew. And he got this special ladle, and it had a meaning to him, so he's sharing this story. Now, he also, as, I, as she was talking about, he had a roommate. Now, his roommate was a female, a young woman. They weren't married. They had separate bedrooms. And then they had the, an extra room, a guest room, where this mother stayed. So they all visited that evening and all went off to bed. The next morning, the mother left to go back home. And when she got home, she received an email from the young man. And in the email, it said, I'm not saying you stole the ladle or didn't steal the ladle, but the ladle is missing. Now, the mother responded, well, I'm not saying you slept with the young girl or didn't sleep with the young girl, but the ladle is under her bed sheets. Hello? You get it? That's kind of like a godly heritage right there. All right? So, the Bible says in 2 Timothy 1 verse 5, I am calling up memories of your sincere and unqualified faith, the leaning of your entire personality on God in Christ and absolute trust and confidence in his power, wisdom, and goodness, a faith that first lived permanently in the heart of your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now, I am fully persuaded, dwells in you also. Now, it seems that every day we hear about tragic events and destruction among our youth, and to the point it appears that we're losing the battle. Satan's winning the battle. Mothers can take a stand against Satan and his demonic forces and the power and authority of Jesus Christ. In other words, moms, many a mother know that the work starts in our individual homes. The Bible is rich 
with wonderful examples of motherhood from Sarah to Mary. Sarah was an old woman that had faced the heartbreak of infertility. But God does miracles, and her son Isaac grows up to become the patriarch of the 12 tribes of Israel, Yoshebed. She finds herself in a very tragic situation when the, when the king, when Pharaoh, orders all the newborn Hebrew boys murdered. But her trust in God saved the life of her son Moses, and God uses Moses to lead his people out of bondage. Listen, there, there's some of you mothers right now, I need to say this, there's some of you mothers right now that are at the point of contemplating giving up on your kids. I exhort you. Sarah was up here. Hang in there. Have hope, right? I'm talking from experience here. I'm not as a mom, but me and Candace raising our three kids that have grown up, and it was not all peaches and cream. Listen, Mom, you got to remember this. All those times you've taken care of them, all those feedings, all those changings, all those washings, all those times you spoke into them, your children have that seed planted inside of them. Right? Your assignment is to stay the course, be there, plant that seed some more, water that seed, and God will make it grow. Hang in there. Right? Think about, like, in the Bible, Hannah, she prayed for a son. She promised that if she would have a son, she'd turn this son over to God. Well, she did. She had a son named Samuel, and she handed him over to God, and she's illustrating to us how our children are not ours, but they're God's, right? Our children are on loan, in other words, from God. We are the stewards of our children. We're not the owners. Another wonderful example is the single mother, the widow of Zarephath. She encounters severe hardship, but he or her, her son's watching, and she set a great example about trusting God for your needs. Or the concerns and responsibilities of Mary, I'm sure, right? Raising the Messiah. These moms learn that God can calm every fear and worry and that he's, a, he's very sufficient for each and every moment that you're going to face, mom. And moms, don't ever doubt that your daily tasks as a mother are important or not important, because they are. Remember, it was a mother who packed a lunch with five loaves and two fishes that was needed to start a miracle. Who knows what wonder God is in store for your child because you are a mom that is faithful. See, it's impossible to raise godly children without the word of God as your guide. You as a parent must live right before your children and let them see God in your life, and that, then they will know that God is real. In this passage today, in 2 Timothy, we read of two women who lived right before Timothy. And there's not a lot of information in Scripture about Lois and Eunice. But what we do know is an encouragement to all mothers who want to raise their children to worship the Lord. Lois and Eunice were kind of like this mother-daughter team that rose up a man of God named Timothy. He turns in to be this trusted companion of the guy who writes half of the New Testament. We find these two women mentioned only in two places. Acts chapter 16, verse 1, and 2 Timothy 1, 5, which we read earlier. But what a very strong commendation the Apostle Paul gives to these two ladies. What is remarkable is that Paul is even mentioning these women at all. A woman, a woman at this time had to be of great significance in those days. In this very case, Paul is honoring Lois and Eunice for their faith, faith because their faith was alive. Their faith was apparent, their faith was contagious, and it nurtured the faith of young Timothy. Mothers and grandmothers can have a very powerful spiritual impact on their families. Through them, many of us see Jesus for the first time. Amen. Before we even speak, we breathe in the heavenly aroma of Christ. Mothers that are pregnant can be speaking right now into their children's hearts. As we watch our mothers and grandmothers, we see, them, we see in them this light that has come into the world. Now, notice that the, the writer here, Paul, doesn't say that Timothy's father or grandfather raised him in the faith. Rather, he gives credit to two godly mothers in Timothy's life, Lois and Eunice. 
The compelling feature of the scriptural record of Lois and Eunice is their faith-filled influence on young Timothy. And since Timothy's father isn't mentioned in connection with Timothy's faith, it's apparent that these two godly women trained him up so that he would know and love God's word. The name Timothy, if you're not aware of, means one who is dear to and reveres God. It's probably a name that was chosen probably by his mother. Now, grandmother and mom had no doubt been the teachers of Timothy during his youth. His fitness to be the companion and co-worker of Paul finds its explanation largely in the home training and pious example given by these two faith-filled women. We have Lois, the grandmother, which comes this legacy of faith that helped bring at least two generations into the family of God. Lois was a Jew. She accepted Jesus as her Savior. We don't know exactly when, but it's probable that she did a decade or two after Jesus' death or resurrection. And coping with any objections that her husband may have had, she brought up her daughter Eunice in the Christian faith. And Eunice did the very same with her son, Timothy. Now I need to bring something up at this point. Because as I began my study of the scriptures a couple of decades ago, this topic, there was a few topics, but this is one of those topics that made me very confused. And I had questions about this. And here's the question. How can mothers train up their boys to be men if the Bible says, do not permit women to teach or have authority over a man, she must be silent? My confusion and question comes mainly from the following two sets of scriptures. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12. The Bible says, I do not think it seemly for a woman to debate publicly or otherwise usurp the authority of men, but she should be silent. And 1 Corinthians 14, verses 34 and 35. Let your women keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but they are to be submissive, as the law also says. And if they want to learn something, let them ask their own husbands at home, for it is shameful for women to speak in church. Is anybody with me on this? Are you, conf are you confused about this? It's okay. You don't have to raise your hand. I'll raise it for you. You can do it silently on blogs like many of you do. Okay? What confused me is this same guy, Paul, wrote that, also contradicts himself in different spots of his writings about women. So that's why I was confused. And please hear me. Please don't take away from that that this is to bash men. Or that women can be out of order. What I've been able to conclude is people have taken these verses out of the context instead of taking what the whole Bible says about this very topic. One thing that helped me was referencing, well, how did Jesus treat women? All right, so let's review a little bit. Jesus went out of his way to challenge the cultural biases against women that was pervasive in Israel during the New Testament period that these books are written. During this very time period, women were considered little more than property. They were also viewed as evil, ignorant, and repulsively immoral. And why? Because that was taught by Jewish religious leaders who did not allow women to enter parts of the temple and also segregated them from men in the synagogues. Women were considered a source of evil because they represented sexual temptation in the original sin of their forebearer, Eve. And because they, weren't value, they were valued only for their subservient role as wives and mothers, they were not permitted to be taught by the rabbis. Basically, women were considered inferior servants, and their place was in the field, or at the well, or in the kitchen. If they ever left the house, they had to be veiled. They were not allowed to talk to any men in public except their, their own husbands. And they were not permitted to testify in court of law, mainly because the witness of a woman was considered untrustworthy. Now, I say all that to say, that is the setting that the Messiah, Jesus Christ, enters as he comes preaching a message of unrestricted access to the Father's love. Okay? Now, Jesus welcomed women in, among his disciples, and he angered other rabbis by breaking this ironclad cultural restriction. We have many examples of Jesus' personal interaction with women in the Gospels. It should be obvious 
that Jesus was underscoring an important truth by his associated actions. Mary, sitting at his feet. The sinful woman who anointed him with oil. The woman who was caught in the act of adultery. The woman at the well. The important truth Jesus is revealing is that he reversed the curse that came in the Garden of Eden. Right? Jesus tipped the scales of justice and showed a group of religious hypocrites how their oppression of women is grieving the Father's heart. The essence of this low view of women is rooted in the misconception of the first female, Eve. People have concluded that she was created by God as an inferior creature with deficient physical strength and less astute mental capabilities and limited spiritual giftedness and that because of her weakness, she was meant to live in a state of subordination to Adam because she was deceived by the serpent. She must be forever punished for her disobedience by living in the shadow of her superior male counterpart. Folks, we must read the Bible rather than read into the Bible. Listen, listen. After Eve's creation, God did not tell her this. He did not say, you are Adam's helper. I command you to serve him well. She was not created for servitude, folks. She was fashioned to be a co-laborer with Adam so they could rule together over creation as they were commissioned to do in Scripture before the fall of man. And when I say fall of man, I include women. Here's what Genesis 1, 27 and 28 says. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Did you hear that? The command to rule was not only directed at Adam. Eve was also commissioned with divine authority. <sighs> Yet so many Christians today believe that God no longer offers the daughters of Eve a place of spiritual influence. Are we surprised then that the church has struggled to make an impact on society when we have denied half of the world's Christians their rightful place of rulership? Eve's subordination to Adam did not occur at her creation. It was a consequence of sin. God's original plan was not that women would be oppressed, denied opportunities, beaten by their husbands, mistreated, raped, stereotyped, bullied, or shamed. God's original destiny for women, a destiny that was secured by Jesus Christ at Calvary, is that she rules on earth through the righteousness of Jesus Christ. After the fall, God handed down punishment to the man, Adam, to the woman, Eve, and to the serpent. The woman's punishment was this. Your husband will rule over you. This is not the intention of God for women. It is the, simply the consequence of disobedience apart from redemption at the cross. Now I want to investigate this some more. <clears throat> Are you aware that many Greek language scholars will testify that part of this very controversial scripture in Corinthians chapter 14th chapter is actually a quote that Paul uses from a letter that that church had written him. And in that letter, the Corinthian church, because see, these are letters, right? They wrote a letter to Paul. It says that in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. He mentions, I'm responding to the letter you wrote me, okay? They wrote a letter to Paul. Paul writes a letter back to them. This was, a new, this was a church plant that he started, and they got questions. That's normal. It's normal. It's okay. So he's answering their questions in 1 Corinthians. That's the whole letter, as well as 2 Corinthians. Okay. So Paul writes that they were seeking guidance and answers. And they're, they're asked, in part of the letter, they're asking for restrictions and harsh treatment for women. But where did that come from? It came from the Jewish traditions. Verses 34 and 35. Can you put that please back up there, Alexandria? 1 Corinthians 14. There it is. Are followed. Now, understand this. When the Bible was written, and until 
language, I mean, they didn't have any periods, commas, quotation. They didn't have any of that. They didn't have any of that, okay? In the Greek language, they did have a symbol, like a, it's kind of like an N almost. And when you saw that symbol, it meant the previous little section was quoted. In the Greek writings of the New Testament, in verse 30, before verse 36, is this very symbol, which, which means there's a, it's quoting something right prior to verse 36. Okay? So, these verses, if you read this whole discourse that starts from 1 Corinthians 14, 21 till 40, Paul is talking about how we're going to all work together because we all have these great gifts and we're going to work together. And we're going to use these gifts. Building up the church. And all of a sudden, verses 34 and 35 pop up. Let your women keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but they are to be submissive, as the law also says. And if they want to learn something, let them ask their own husbands at home. For it's shameful for women to speak in church. They make no sense and come out of nowhere to contradict everything Paul had been saying about full participation for all Christians, male and female. Right? This is the same guy that wrote, there will be, there will be no division between male or female, rich or poor, free nor slave. No division. We're all one in Christ Jesus. Paul spells this out, right, in this whole discourse. He had spent several chapters telling the Corinthians that all of you can prophesy one by one. Verse 31 says that. Paul states in 1 Corinthians 11.5 that women can pray and prophesy publicly. Just a few chapters earlier. Why would he now, a few verses later, say that women cannot speak in church? So you understand why many of us get confused, okay? And what else is curious is this reference in verse 34 that says women are not allowed to speak just as the law also says. Can you put that back up there, Alexandria? Keep it up there. First, verse 14, 34 and 35. See that? Just as the law also says. What law? There's no reference in Scripture it's not referring to an Old Testament law, but to a Jewish rabbinical tradition that was added, that the young Corinthian church has adopted. And then what about verse 35? It's improper for a woman to speak, or in this version it says, it's shameful for a woman to speak in church. Do we really believe this verse reflects the heart of God? Is that the view of the Apostle Paul who ordained women to serve with him in apostolic ministry? Phoebe, Priscilla, Junia. Paul quotes, he used the Greek symbol in verse, starting with verse 36, these verses, 34 and 35, to point out to those of us, or those then at Corinth, who hold a degrading view of women, to those who actually described women in Jew Jewish writings as vile and disgraceful, here's the response he gives them in verse 36. Go ahead and put that up, Alexandria. 1 Corinthians 14, 36. What? Came the word of God out from you? Question mark, question mark. Or did it come unto you only? This response makes no sense if we believe that Paul wrote verses 34 and 35. Can I, can, does it make sense? Does this make sense? I'm trying to teach you something here. Now remember, remember, the only one that gets in your ear out of the five-fold ministry is the teacher. He's the only one that gets in your ear, and I'm teaching you right now. You've got to understand this. It's got to get in your ear, right? If, if, but if he's contradicting a statement made by the confused new church plant in Corinth, then I think we can understand this defiant, defiant tone that he's using in verse 36. In other words, what Paul is really saying is, what in the world are you knuckleheads doing in this church? You want to silence women when the gospel of Jesus was first preached to women after they saw Jesus at the tomb? Do you really think the gospel is only for men to proclaim? Huh. Oh, and then we got Ephesians 5. I love this one. It's not going to be up there. I just put this in there myself this morning. Chapter 5, verses 21 through 33, discusses... This is a wonderful wall of wives and husbands, okay? And it's talking about this submission and love, okay? 
We are, and verse 21 starts off this in Ephesians chapter 5. It says, we are to submit one to another. That's how it starts. Then it goes on, and this is a very misunderstood concept. Submission does not mean that you're supposed to be a doormat. Right? Remember now, and if you're having a problem with this, Jesus submitted to his Father, yet every knee will bow to him. Okay? So, these verses then, when you read them, instruct women to submit to their husbands and for husbands to love their wives. Now, let's be very crystal clear here. Women get the opportunity to submit to their husbands, and men, you get the opportunity to die for your wives. Why? That's what the Bible says here in these scriptures. Husbands, you're the spiritual head, and the wives are to acknowledge that headship. But real spiritual leadership involves loving service in the form of dying to the self. Hello. That's what it means. All right? Just as Jesus served the disciples, washing the disciples' feet. Husbands are to serve their wives in this manner. What this really boils down to is a very wise and Christ-honoring husband will not take advantage of his leadership role. And a very wise and Christ-honoring wife will not try to undermine her husband's leadership. Hello. Right? Now, I said all that to point out that it seems odd that Christians would have difficulty accepting the authority of women when every man has to submit to the instruction and discipline of his own mother. I don't know about you, but I've seen a lot of, like, sporting events in my life where the only thing, whenever a camera would get in an athlete's face, is, Hi, Mom! Right? Now, they're men. They're acknowledging Mom. And many of them will say, My mom taught me well. Right? See, folks, rather than argue about whether women are weak, can't we acknowledge that we're all just clay vessels? Right? We're all frail in our humanity and our tendency to sin. None of us who aspire to minister can ever hope to see lives changed by Jesus Christ's presence if we rely on our own fleshly abilities. We are called to glory in our weakness so that Christ might be strong within us. I mean, if you're struggling with this, then we surely can find examples that Jesus taught us that women could not speak and teach men. You're not going to find any. Luke chapter 8, for instance. Let's, let's look at this one. I love this one. And it came to pass after these things, Jesus was traveling in cities and villages, preaching and giving good news of the kingdom of God. And his twelve were with him. And the women, who were healed of diseases and unclean spirits, Mary, who was called Magdala, from whom seven demons went out, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, the steward of Herod, and Susanna, and many others, who ministered to them of their wealth. This is the scripture that if you know me, this is the one I say. These were the wealthy women that funded Jesus' ministry. Because it's usually women who fund it because men think too much of their pocketbooks and think they're all that because of what they have or don't have. Is this the truth? See, folks, these women mentioned here are not just stragglers who stayed at the back cooking meals and serving only in kids' ministry. Hello. How come it's the women who can be the only ones who do the kids' ministry or go overseas into the very tough places? See, when the Holy Spirit arrived on Pentecost, there were women in the upper room as well. And this was noted by Peter right in his first sermon. He, he shares Joel's prophecy where it says, Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. What about the Samaritan woman Jesus met at the well? After that encounter, she tells, you know, she begins telling others about Jesus. He told her to go tell everybody in town. Do you know in other times, he tells people don't say anything. And this time he tells her, go tell everybody about me. Why would Jesus send this woman into her village to tell others about his power if he wanted to make the point that he was opposed to the concept of women in ministry? Hello! Right? Folks, in fact, this is the first recorded instance in which Christ commissioned someone to evangelize beyond the narrow confines of the Orthodox Jewish community. This woman was doing the great commission of spreading the gospel in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the entire world. Now, I'm going to ask the band to come back up. See, the Bible says from a child, Eunice had taught her boy to know the Holy Scriptures. 2 Timothy 3, verse 15. And how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through Christ, through faith in Christ Jesus. It's right, therefore, to connect this home training of Timothy in the fear of God with his and his mother's conversion of the gospel. Timothy is the first 
second generation Christian mentioned in the New Testament. He became a Christian not because an evangelist preached a powerful sermon, but because his mother and grandmother had taught him the Holy Scriptures when he was a small boy. Moms, do you see your importance? A mother knows that teaching a small child is both an opportunity as well as a responsibility. Never, ever underestimate the far-reaching consequences of raising just one small child to love the Lord. The effect of Lois and Eunice's godly parenting is apparent to the readers of the New Testament. Thanks to their witness, Timothy grew to become a powerful force in the early church, impacting hundreds or even thousands of lives with the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Even today, God will use godly mothers and grandmothers to be Lois's and Eunice's in their families. There's many of them that, I'm, that are looking at me right now. Right? This Mother's Day, I'd encourage you to thank your moms, your grandmas, for passing to you a legacy of faith. Now, folks, <clears throat> I hope you go back and listen to this one again if you want to prove me wrong. But you're going to be proving God. You're going to have to prove God wrong because that's what he did for everybody. He made it for all. Yes, the scriptures do say, wives, you have to submit to your hundreds. That's not the issue. You're supposed to do that. But husbands, you're supposed to be the head. <laughs> Well, let me tell you, it's hard. So we got men's breakfast next Saturday. Why don't you come around? We'll help you a little bit. We'll lament a little bit. Let's just keep it amongst the dads, okay? And the men, you get it? We got some work to do, and it's okay. It's okay if you're struggling, guys. But let's today focus on our moms. Let's thank them. Let's thank the Lord who gave us mothers that care for us, that caress us, that love us even when we don't deserve it. Folks, I hope you're inspired, if you haven't received Jesus Christ, to pull on his grace and mercy by asking him into your heart, asking for forgiveness, confessing him out of your mouth, believing in your heart that he is your Lord and Savior forevermore. We partake in communion here, which is another way to praise and worship him, along with the band, along with the word, along with the prophesying. You partake in it if you've received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. The altar team will be up here to pray with you. So I ask you all to come to your feet and continue praising and worshiping our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.